Hello again. This is part three of our series on the Levites. I'm going to take a little break from the history now. So far we've covered the Levites up until the end of the first temple period. Uh, the first temple ended when the city of Jerusalem was destroyed by the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar II, in 586 BC. And we have a pretty good idea of the role the Levites played in society up until that time. Now, according to the prophets, particularly the prophet Jeremiah, the people would spend 70 years in captivity and then be brought back from their captivity and restored. So we'll, we'll quickly take a quick look at this prophecy in Jeremiah. Okay, first we'll take a look at Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 11 and 12. And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon seventy years. And it shall come to pass, when the seventy years are accomplished, that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, says the Lord, for their iniquity, and the land of the Chaldeans, and I will make it perpetual desolations. And it's also mentioned in chapter 29 of Jeremiah, verse 10. For this says the Lord, that after seventy years are accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you, in causing you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you unexpected end. And you shall call upon me, and you shall go and pray to me, and I will hearken to you. And you shall seek me and find me, when you shall search for me with all your heart. So, um, this is the 70 years that Jeremiah spoke of, that the exiles were looking forward to, and when the kingdom would be restored. Uh, we've already looked at the God's promise to David, uh, which is recorded in 2 Samuel chapter 7, where God promised David that a seed from him, one of his progeny, would sit on the throne of the kingdom of Israel forever, and that this would be a rule of peace over the entire earth. And when the exiles returned after 70 years in captivity in Babylon, they were expecting this eternal kingdom to be set up by God. And they were rebuilding Jerusalem and rebuilding the temple, expecting this. And so this also reverts back to a few of the prophecies that we're going to take a, a deeper look at in this video, just to sort of see the, what was going through their minds when they were coming back and rebuilding the city. And, and what they were working toward, and what they were expecting. The prophet Isaiah was a prophet during four kings of Judah. From King Uzziah, who is also called Azariah in some books. It's just two different uh, translations of the same name, Azariah, Uzziah. And Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. So those four kings were the time of the four kings that the prophet Isaiah spoke to. And during the reign of Ahaz was when Tiglath-Pileser III, in 721 BC, he came and took the uh, captives of the northern kingdom. And then his uh, predecessor, Sargon II, finally destroyed the uh, city of Samaria, and that was the end of the northern kingdom. That all happened during the reign of Ahaz. Um, 
Ahaz, he sort of listened, half listened to Isaiah, but mostly didn't listen to him. And instead of taking Isaiah's advice and prophecy, he made a deal with Damascus to, um, in, to form a coalition with the northern kingdom of Israel and against Assyria, which failed um, because Isaiah told him it was going to fail, but he didn't believe him. And then Hezekiah, um, he sort of half listened to Isaiah too. He, he rebuilt the temple and, and he restored God's religion in Jerusalem and in Judah. But when he got into trouble with the king of Assyria, he stripped the gold off the doors of the temple and gave that as a tribute to the king of Assyria. And the king of Assyria came and besieged Jerusalem. We spoke about this in one of the previous videos. I'm not sure which one. So Isaiah was a very important prophet, and he lived during those times. And he was the first major prophet. Uh, we call him a major prophet because simply because he wrote a big book. It's 66 chapters long. Um, some of the other prophets, which we would call minor prophets, they, their books are more like maybe five to ten pages at the most. Some of them are only one page. So there's three major prophets in the Old Testament. Uh, Isaiah, Ezekiel, and Jeremiah. Okay, if we um, look at the uh, restoration of the kingdom... In the, near the end of the book of Isaiah, I'll give you some of the language here. It it's basically appears from chapter 65, verse 17, until chapter 66, verse 21. I, I don't need to read the whole thing, but I'll just read some of it to, just to give you the language here of what Isaiah is saying. And this is the story the things that were in the minds of the exiles returning to rebuild the city. Okay, starting in chapter 65, verse 17. For behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. But be you glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For, for behold, I create... Jerusalem a rejoicing, and her people a joy. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem, and joy in my people. And the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her, nor the voice of crying. There shall no more be in her an infant of days, nor an old man that has not filled his days. And they shall build houses and inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. And they shall not build and another inhabit, and they shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of the tree are the days of my people, and my elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands, they shall not labor in vain, nor bring forth for trouble. For they are the seed of the blessed of the Lord, and their offspring with them. For it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer, and while they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together, and the lion shall eat straw like the bullock, and the dust shall be the serpent's meat. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, says the Lord. Rejoice you with Jerusalem, and be glad with her, all you that love her. Rejoice! For joy with her, all you that mourn for her, that you may suck and be satisfied with the breasts of her consolations, that you may milk out and be delighted with the abundance of her glory. For thus says the Lord, Behold, I will extend peace to her like a river, and the glory of the Gentiles like a flowing stream. Then you shall suck, you shall be born upon her sides and be dandled upon her knees. As one whom his mother comforts, so I will comfort you, 
and you shall be comforted in Jerusalem. And when you see this, your heart shall rejoice, and your bones shall flourish like a herb, and the hand of the Lord shall be known towards his servants, and his indignation towards his enemies. And they shall bring all your brethren for an offering unto the Lord out of all nations upon horses, and in chariots, and in litters, and upon mules, and upon swift beasts, to my holy mountain, Jerusalem, says the Lord, as the children of Israel bring an offering in a clean vessel into the house of the Lord. And I will also take of them for priests and for Levites, says the Lord. For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I shall make, shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. So you can sort of see the language here of this restoration of the temple and of the city of Jerusalem uh, in, the, in the final pages of Isaiah's prophecy. Jeremiah also prophesied of this time. Now, Jeremiah was a prophet. He started to be, be a prophet during the days of Josiah, who is one, two, three kings after Hezekiah. And Josiah had three sons, which are named right, on, right under him. These arrows around here are all under Josiah, are his family being shuffled in power structures all leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem by uh, Nebuchadnezzar II, the king of Babylon. So um, starting from the time of Josiah leading right up into the destruction of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar during the time of Zedekiah, Jeremiah was the prophet during this whole time in Jerusalem. So we're going to read Jeremiah's prophecy, and that's found in chapter 33 of Jeremiah, where he talks about the restoration. And again, I don't need to read the whole thing, but we'll just get the language of it. Beginning in chapter 33, verse 4, For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the houses of this city, and concerning the houses of the kings of Judah, which are thrown down by the mounts and by the sword. They come to fight with the Chaldeans, but it is to fill them with the dead bodies of men, whom I have slain in my anger and in my fury, and for all whose wickedness I have hid my face from this city. Behold, I will bring it health and cure, and I will cure them, and I will reveal unto them the abundance of peace and truth. And I will cause the captivity of Judah and the captivity of Israel to return, and I will build them as at the first. And I will cleanse them from all their iniquity, whereby they have sinned against me. And I will pardon all their iniquities, whereby they have sinned, and whereby they have transgressed against me. And it shall be to me a name of joy, a praise, and an honor before all the nations of the earth, which shall hear all the good that I do unto them. And they shall fear and tremble for all the goodness and for all the prosperity that I procure unto it. Thus says the Lord, Again there shall be heard in this place which you say shall be desolate without a man and without beast, even in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem that are desolate without man and without inhabitant and without beast the voice of joy and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the voice of them that shall say, Praise the Lord of hosts, for the Lord is good, for his mercy endures forever, and of them that shall bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord, for I will cause to return the captivity of the land as at the first, says the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Again in this place which is desolate without man and without beast, and in all the cities thereof shall be a habitation of shepherds causing their flocks to lie down. 
in the cities of the mountains, in the cities of the vale, and in the cities of the south, and in the land of Benjamin, and in the places around Jerusalem, and in the cities of Judah, shall the flocks pass again under the hands of him that tells them, says the Lord. Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that I will perform that good thing which I have promised unto the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. In those days and at that time I will cause the branch of righteousness to grow up unto David, and he shall execute judgment and righteousness in the land. In those days shall Judah be saved, and Jerusalem shall dwell safely, and this is the name wherewith she, be, she shall be called, the Lord our righteousness. For thus says the Lord, David shall never want a man to sit upon the throne of the house of Israel. Neither shall the priests, the Levites, want a man before me to offer burnt offerings and to kindle meat offerings and to do sacrifice continually. And the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah, saying, Thus says the Lord, If you can break my covenant of the day and my covenant of the night, and that there should not be day and night in their season, then may also my covenant be broken with David my servant, that he should not have a son to reign upon his throne, and with the Levites, the priests, my ministers. And as the host of heaven cannot be numbered, neither the sand of the sea measured, so will I multiply the seed of David my servant, and the Levites that minister unto me. So this is, uh, you can get an idea of what these captives returning and rebuilding were expecting to happen. And Ezekiel also spoke of this. Now Ezekiel, he was taken during the time of uh, Jehoiachin. Jehoiachin was the second last king in um, in Jerusalem. And he rebelled and he joined a coalition with Egypt to stand against Babylon. And Nebuchadnezzar came and took the city of Jerusalem, but he didn't destroy it. He took Jehoiachin and a whole bunch of captives with him, and he set Zedekiah up as the puppet king in Jerusalem. And then it was later on, this was in 593 BC, and then in 586 Zedekiah also rebelled, and that's when Nebuchadnezzar came back and actually destroyed the city. So Ezekiel was taken in 593 with the captives, with Jehoiachin. And he prophesied during um, those years, living among the captives. So Ezekiel also speaks of the uh, final restoration. Um, from chapter 41 to chapter 48, so it's huge. It's the whole end of the book of Ezekiel where he has this great vision of the temple. And this is a marvelous, beautiful temple that he sees in his vision. And he goes through it in great detail. And he measures the temple. And he goes through every chamber in the temple. And he talks all about the gates of the temple and how the glory of the Lord fills the temple and the laws of the temple, the gate of the prince, the instructions for the Levites who are going to be in the temple doing the work of the temple. Uh, he's talking about the prince of the land, which... I assume would be the the son of David that they are expecting to come to rule forever. And the worship of the prince. And it goes through the, the meat offerings and, and every um, ritual to be performed by the priests in the temple. And there's a river flowing from the temple. 
and it's just in great detail if you want to read it you know it and it goes through all the tribes of Israel and it's a great restoration of all the the temple in Jerusalem and then the very last line of the book of Ezekiel, after he goes through all this stuff about the temple, he says in chapter 48, verse 35, It was round about 18,000 measures, and the name of the city from that day shall be Jehovah is there. So this is, again, speaks to what these exiles returning and rebuilding were expecting to happen. So um, what happened was it, it, the second temple was built on the foundation of the first temple and the city was rebuilt, but this led up to Herod's temple, which was uh, built upon the second temple. It was greatly expanded upon and built into one of the seven wonders of the world by Herod the Great. And that's the temple that Jesus preached at. And that's the temple where, uh, in Jerusalem, where Jesus was uh, crucified and rose from the dead. So, it's sort of like this temple is kind of like, if you read it, you can read it in both ways. You can read it as a Jew expecting the second temple to be this. And, you, and as a Christian, you can read it and you can see the Christian narrative coming forth as this is the second coming of Christ. Because this is what they were not expecting. This is what the demonic forces of evil were not expecting, was this two parts of the Messiah's ministry that he came and he was put to death and rose from the dead as the eternal king with eternal life that's the part they were not expecting and then in the second coming is the final restoration it's much like the first temple and the second temple of Jewish history represents like the first coming and the second coming of Christ. There's a, a, a destruction and a captivity. That's, that's what Jesus refers to as a carrying your cross. As Christians are living in the evil world, it's not a restored world. And then in the final restoration will be the final kingdom of Christ, and that is spoken of in the book of Revelation, where the idea of Revelation, the book of Revelation has over almost 400 references to the Old Testament prophecies. And the book of Revelation, the idea behind it is that now that Jesus has performed his mission, of um, being crucified, dying, and being resurrected as the eternal king, now that he has done this, now the secrets of God can be revealed. And the revelation is kind of like a map and the keys to understanding what all the prophets were talking about, really. Um, so... Now we look at the Revelation and we see um, the final restoration talked about in the Revelation. And this is where it's, there's nothing hidden. It's just given in plain sight. Now the other thing to understand, we're going to be covering this in the next few videos um, in our continuing series about Levites, is that during this restoration, um, during the Second Temple period when they were building it, the, the, the priest and the king, or the governor of Jerusalem and the priest, were two different people. And 
the prophets that were sent to help them were Haggai and Zechariah, which we will look at in pretty good detail. And in the book of Zechariah, the priest, the high priest, is the anointed. And the king is also the anointed. And the crown of the king is placed upon the high priest. So that these two offices are put together into one person. And in the ministry of Jesus, we, we will also look at that, where Jesus was actually the king and the high priest in one office. So this is another thing that was not realized until Jesus Christ. If you look at the word um, Messiah, in Hebrew it's Messiah. It's, uh, it's simply a word that, ne that means anointed, anointed with oil, um, made uh, very special by God for an office. The priests were typically anointed, um, especially the high priest. He was anointed to do the work of the high priest. And the kings of Israel were all anointed, as each one was anointed with oil, and he was known as God's anointed. And the high priest was also known as God's anointed. And the, the lower priests were also anointed ones. They were all Messiah. But where we get the idea of Messiah comes from some prophecy of Daniel, where he speaks of the Messiah, the anointed one, which is the seed of David who will rule forever. That's the anointed one, the 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 anointed one of all anointed ones. So that is Jesus. He's the king and the priest. But we will uh, look at that in detail after. But I just want you to understand that before we look at Revelation. Because Revelation is showing us the temple after this has happened. We'll find it. Revelation chapter 21 and 22. I'll just sort of breeze through it to give you an idea of the language. And I saw, this is very much like Isaiah. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven, saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there any more be pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I will make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And I'll skip ahead, okay. Okay, there came to me one of the seven angels which had the seven vials of full of the seven last plagues and talked with me saying, Come here, I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. This is the church, this is the people of God. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God having the glory of God, and her light was like a stone, most precious, even like jasper stone, clear as crystal, and had a great wall, great and high, and had twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and the names written on them were the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. 
Okay, and it goes through all the gates and what kind of stones. Now, beginning of verse 22, Revelation chapter 21. And I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of sun, neither of moon, to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor to it. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night, and they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. And then starting in chapter 22, And he showed me a pure river of the water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, there was the tree of life, which bore the twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads, and there shall be no night there, and they shall need no candle, nor light of sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. So this is um, how you can see under Jesus Christ, the second coming, there's a, the, there's a destruction of the earth by fire. It's called the baptism of fire. And there will be this restoration of the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven. So if you understand this and then go back to the Old Testament prophets uh, of Isaiah, Ezekiel, and Jeremiah, then you can s sort of see those prophecies under the light of this understanding. And, and you sort of, um, it's like an updating of it. So that is, uh, that concludes our study of the final restoration and the prophecies. It's, uh, this is not a great detailed study, but it's just an overview because I want to have this understanding while we start to look at the the return of the captives under uh, Nehemiah and Ezra, which are the two books we're going to look at next in part four. So I'll see you then. And don't forget to like and share and subscribe if you like the videos. And I noticed that about 50% of the viewers are subscribers. So if you don't, if you want to see these videos as they come out, they come out quite sporadically because some of them actually take a lot more work than others and a lot more studying. And my life gets busy sometimes and, you know, things happen. So um, I'll try to be more consistent, but it's not easy with this kind of topic. So uh, if you want to get a notice when I put out new videos, just hit the subscribe button and hit the bell saying that you would like to be notified and you will get a notification when on YouTube when one of my videos comes out. Thank you very much.